I'm happy that North Charleston stepped up and, and did the right thing and did it quickly, but quite frankly, they had no choice. We all saw what happened in North Charleston. And when we see what happens, then, then all of the country steps up and says something has to be done. Simple policy changes, every officer in America ought to be wearing a lapel camera right now, every single one. The last 24 hours have been filled with a mixture of shock, revulsion, calls for action long overdue, baseless accusations, political posturing, decisive action, and the usual question as to why something hasn't been done about a serious situation already. A nation talking every day about security of those who live here and talking every day about those who deal in that security and have not just become part of the problem, but have actually been a key facet of the issue for generations. All right, new facets in the arena. First of all, let's welcome former Republican Congressman from Minnesota, now director of the Graduate School of Political Management at George Washington University, Mark Kennedy. And here in the studio, joined by the nationally syndicated expert on automotive issues with a keen eye on politics and a whole lot more. She never minces words. The car coach Lauren Fix is here. I thank you so much for joining us, Congressman. Good to see you. Good to be with you, Ed. All right, I'm going to start with you on this one here because we just heard a soundbite coming in basically talking about the fact that the police in South Carolina had no choice because we all saw the video right now. But is it not fair to say, though, that they did act, though? They didn't mince any time whatsoever. They saw it. They took the evidence available and did what is necessary, correct? The police administration did, and clearly the police officer didn't realize that in the world of everybody has a video camera in their hands at all time. Uh, they didn't uh, react and anticipate in the way they should have. Did they react fast enough? That seems to be the question, Congressman. I think that's been answered, but many people are also going to say, gee, if there wasn't this video, we wonder what would be done. I think that's going to burn for a long time, don't you? It, it will burn. There's clearly a lot of distrust out there, but the rapid way in which they reacted, the affirmative way in which they acted, I think is a step towards trying to rebuild that trust with the community. Now that trust with the community, Lauren, that, that's what a lot of people are talking about now when it comes down to law enforcement. That trust has got to be earned. This is not going to help. This is going to drive that trust back even farther. So then people around the country are asking, what do we need to do in order to have the people and the cops actually working together and not actually at each other's throats? You know, it, it's, they always say, you know, one bad apple spoils the whole bushel. And in this case, one bad cop who does something that is caught on camera, in, and, and this is a really bad situation, especially when they, there's video of him going back and placing something next to the mm -hmm. victim. That's just shows that there are bad cops out there. There probably always has been, but there's a lot of great police officers out there that are involved in the community, that work with kids, that do so many positive things, and those are never covered by the press. And that's the problem that needs to be covered more to show the positive to try and overlook this. Which is why we do have to root these guys out. I mean, right. there's no doubt Absolutely. he shot somebody in the back. He didn't have to do it. If he's a bad cop, get him out. Right. But we need to make sure that the ones we don't see video of are the ones that are also getting kicked out, right? Right. There's a lot of, lot of bad police officers out there, and I, I think some of the people at the top know who they are. They have records. You, you can find that out if you're a police officer within the precinct. And they're kind of saying, well, we know this person's a problem. We'll wait till something happens. This is a bad thing to happen. This is not good for any of the police officers out there. And you want to know no matter what color skin you have, that if you get pulled over by a police officer, that you're not going to be running away and getting shot at. That's a serious problem. And those, those police officers need to be rooted out of the system. Congressman, is there the possibility that we may see federal guidelines here, federal training, if you will, because there are some people saying that with all the various police departments out there, maybe the government needs to step in and help to train them and make these police departments, the small towns as well, just as culpable as the big guys. Well, you'll find that, uh, as was mentioned, the good policemen are more frustrated than even those uh, segments of society that feel as if that the police department's been their enemy. So the good policemen stepping forth and pushing for action is a bottoms-up way of doing this. But clearly there will be those that will want to take a federal action and say federal training, federal standards, but policing has largely been a local or state function. And I think it's incumbent upon the states uh, to take the lead on this and to ensure that there's standard setting. But for each individual good cop to say, I don't want to have my reputation tarnished. I'm very proud of the work I want to do. And I want to ensure that all cops, all police officers, all law enforcement are 
comply with those high standards. We have got to get out there and get the good cops to get in there and say something. We have to tell them that they are desired to say something. We want them to say something. They will be protected, and it is the right thing to do. Congressman, please hold on just a couple of moments. Lauren, hang on as well. When we come back, we're going to deal with the Boston Marathon bomber trial. I'm going to ask a simple question. Just one question. You'll have to answer it, too. Midpoint is next. My heart goes out to the families here, but I don't support the death penalty. Uh, I think that he should spend his life in jail. No possibility of parole. He should die in prison. But that's how I see it. All right, back to work in the arena. Former Republican congressman from Minnesota, now director of the Graduate School of Political Management at George Washington University, Mark Kennedy. And here in studio, nationally syndicated expert on automotive issues, the car coach, Lauren Fix. Lauren, I'm going to start with you on this one here. Jokar Zarnayev is found guilty on 30 counts in the Boston Marathon bombing, unanimous. 17 of them carry the death penalty. People now in Massachusetts and around the country are now considering, could I pull the switch? You know, that's a really good question. And, and I think that if you've lost a family member, you probably do want to pull the switch in most cases. But the fact is, that's kind of what they want. They want to be martyrs. So if you give them what they want and they can go to heaven with their whatever virgins that are supposed to be up there, then I they can... i lost track of the number of virgins. Yeah, whatever it is... It, it's far from my, it's all silliness because the fact is this person needs to be in a cold cell underneath the ground with no windows and will slide food underneath the door forever because that's not what they want. They want to die. We're not going to give them that. You Congressman, should. that's what a lot of people are feeling too as we hear this conversation. They're saying that don't make him a martyr because that's exactly what he and his people want. I mean, the real goal of a punishment here is to try to discourage similar behavior. And in this case, particularly with a number of the uh, the things that have been promulgated by the community that he comes from, I think there's a lot of uh, reasons to consider not making him a martyr. But we do then get to the other side of this argument, people saying that there were bodies on the street, that he blew up children, that there are lives changed forever. So, Congressman, don't we have to at least look at that side of the argument for the people who would say very quickly, yes, I'll pull the switch I think we need to understand where that's coming from. Well, we clearly need to look at it, and that's something that the jury is going to have to go through and consider and weigh the balances of. But, uh, you know, as you know, Massachusetts itself is a very Catholic state, and the Catholics oftentimes concern that, you know, retribution is not a reason for action. The real only reason for action here is will it prevent that type of tragedy from happening again? So which result is going to end up having less crazies going and killing our youth and our families in the future. Are you in favor of the death penalty, Congressman? Uh, I am not in favor of the death penalty, no. Okay, Lauren? I think it, in some cases, yes. In this case, I'm not giving him what he wants. I say put him in a cold cell six feet under the ground and let him just rot there for life with no possibility of any way, shape, or form for him to get out. Now, if it was me and I had lost a family member, I'd probably want to be the one to pull the trigger. All right, 90 seconds to go. Something else here. The VA scandal continues. And, Congressman, to you on this one, we find out that a year after the whole VA scandal began, things haven't really changed. There are still veterans who are out there waiting tremendous amounts of time. They're not getting the treatment they need. Nothing has really changed. That's despicable. It is uh, very disappointing and despicable. And this shows the challenge of both changing government as well as if you want to change government, how hard it is to sustain pressure on getting past the barriers that are there, the built-in uh, constituencies that like to have things exactly the way they are and that are really, in many ways, roadblocks to change, roadblocks to better treatment for our veterans. So this is both a challenge to the government as well as a challenge to those that are trying to promulgate activism to activate for the kind of change that the country is so desperately wanting. I got about 40 seconds before we take a break, but I have a lot of veteran friends and I am appalled at this. I'm angry. I have a lot of veteran friends as well, and it's very upsetting. These people went and put their lives on the line for our freedom, and we treat them this way is, it's despicable. And, and the fact that the president hasn't done anything about it, Congress hasn't done anything about it, they say they have. Would they fire one person? These, these vets are not getting what they deserve. They have lip serviced in many ways because I'm, I'm looking at the stats right now. The number of medical appointments that take longer than 90 days to complete, 90 days, has doubled 
since they started this, and we were told that this was all going to get better. It hasn't gotten better. It's gotten worse. Yeah. Let's hope maybe that if we at least show a little indignancy, maybe something will happen one of these days. All right. So. Congressman, please hang on just a couple of minutes. Lauren Fix, please hang on as well, because we're going to take a break and come back. And when we do, a major university here in America, they have a movie, one of the best movies of the year. They said we're not going to show it because we want to protect people on campus. We'll talk about that and more when we continue right here on the arena. More from the arena, former Republican congressman from Minnesota, now director of the Graduate School of Political Management at George Washington University, Mark Kennedy, and nationally syndicated expert on automotive issues, the car coach Lauren Fix joins us. Gentlemen and lady, last segment here, and uh, Congressman, I'm going to start with you on this one. The University of Michigan had decided that they were going to show the movie American Sniper, but then they said, sorry, we're not going to show it. We are receiving complaints from nearly 300 students saying that the film perpetuates negative and misleading stereotypes and sympathizes with a mass killer. Now, to be fair, they've backed up on it now and said, wait, we are going to show it. The president said it was wrong in the first place. But when you hear something like this, I don't know, that, that chafes a lot of people here when they say, you want to just keep people from watching a movie because it upsets a few people. You know, the role of academia is to deal with challenging issues and, and not to not run controversial movies, excuse me, not to run uncontroversial movies, but to run controversial movies. And in this case, the American Sniper is one of the top issues, top grossing videos in the land. And if it has controversial issues engaged with it, then the university ought to have that conversation. If it's provoking those complaints, let's get people in the room and let's talk about does this really have the basis that they're complaining about? Is there some stereotypes that we need to work through? Those are valid things for academia to be addressing. Well, I, I have an issue with that because I, I think one of the things, they wanted to run Paddington Bear, which is ridiculous instead. For college students. For college students, really? I had a bunch of kindergartners? Since when does minority rule? When, does, when do, was two people, 300 people of thousands of people on campus say, okay, so the 300 people have a complaint for whatever reason. We don't really even know if there really are 300 people that have a complaint about American Sniper? I mean, it was at, you know, there's no problem with Well, the what mass they're saying is it, it promotes anti-Muslim rhetoric and sympathizes with a mass killer. I think what the congressman's saying here is part of it, too. If this is college. This is education. Right. Shouldn't you be looking at all sides of an issue and right. let people make their own decision instead of making it for them? But that's what a lot of the colleges are doing. I have two kids in college, and they come home and they tell me things that I can't believe that some of these professors are discussing. Their, their opinion is what they try to instill into the students. They don't teach them to think, which is what colleges need to be doing. Congressman, is that maybe fair to say that a lot of times what happens is with, with certain academia, they want to push their opinion on you. They want to make you think as they think, and they don't give you that chance to see both sides. You know, the number one diversity we need to have in academia is both sides, is having controversy, is having two different people with radically different views in a room, putting forth their best arguments, honing those arguments, finding out whether they're true or valid. You know, the question of does this portray Muslims in a negative way is a great topic for conversation. I could see an academic, an academic institution running that movie and then having that conversation in a civil manner so that people can learn from it. I only got about a minute left. I'm going to hit you both on this because, as I said to our last panel, I said this is the most gripping thing that is now grabbing America. It has everybody talking. Everybody has an opinion. Congressman, to you first, the National Football League has its first female official. I know that there are some people who are very upset, but let's be honest. Let's stop this. If you can, if you can do the job, who cares, right? Uh, they should have had that a long time ago because if you look at the viewers of the NFL, if you look at who they want to reach out to, the news networks have had news commentators that have been female for a long time. They understand it. They're in the marketplace. So I think it's long overdue, and it's a very wise move for the NFL to broaden the number of constituencies that it's reaching out to. I only got 20 seconds left, but I think you would say we've had female officials in motorsports for decades. For decades, <laughs> right. And, and, and as I, I, the, the rudest way I think I put it is, since when do boobs make you not a qualified NFL official? If you know your product, you know the business, and you are going to make fair calls, then you should have the same opportunity as anyone else. If you're not good at your job, 
We'll find someone that is. There you go. Well put. Congressman, we want to thank you so much for joining us. I'll look forward to the next time. Lauren Fix, always a pleasure to have you in the studio. Great to see you. We'll talk to you again real thank soon. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Third and final Midpoint Hour on deck. What Mother Nature and man have wrought in California will impact every single one of us, whether we like it or not. The reality of what happens when a cop becomes an inmate. And we recall an event from World War II that needs to not only be remembered, but put into a 2015 perspective on its anniversary. That and so much more when we continue here on Midpoint.